I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It is not arrogant. Or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but it rejoices with truth. Love bears all things. <laughs> Believes all things. Hopes all things. <laughs> Endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then, face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three. But the greatest of these is love. 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 Well, good morning and welcome back, Chapel Street Church. It's good to be together. If you are new with us or just joining us today, we are in the middle of a series that's been focused on perhaps some of the Apostle Paul's most famous writings. Uh, it's a selection from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, actually the whole chapter, that describe and define love. And it's beautiful. It, it is compelling. And yet it's also been for me, and I, I would imagine for many of you, it's been convicting as well. In fact, if, if I'm being entirely honest with you, as we have worked our way through this passage, I have at times felt overwhelmed. Looking at what Paul describes and, and saying, is this really realistic? In fact, I felt a lot like I did in my junior year. Uh, my basketball coach gathered the team together at the end of the season, as he always did. We had a dinner together, and, and at the end of our meeting, he handed out to us uh, our summer workout program. And then he put in the VCR, this VHS tape. Uh, if you're under the age of 25, you can ask somebody older than you what that is. But it it showed us the Steve Alford All-American Workout. In fact, I brought a picture today of, of this, this VHS tape. That's Steve Alford. He was a player on the uh, Indiana basketball team, the national championship team that won in 1987. That's what our hair looked like in the late 80s. And that's increasingly what our hair is looking like these days. Um, and... This program was a series that basically boiled down to taking thousands of shots in his backyard every day to become prolific. If you saw on the cover, it said it's a 50-minute program. But I'll tell you from experience, it's 50 minutes if you make every shot and you have somebody rebounding the basketball for you. It's about three and a half hours if you shot the ball like I did and you had to chase down every missed shot. And I remember at the time when my, my coach was laying all this out, feeling very similar to how I have felt over these last few weeks. On the one hand, absolutely inspired. Like, I, I want to do this. You're encouraged by it. And on the other hand, almost defeated because I recognize that, that I'm going to, to fall short. Right, this has been my reaction to listening to Paul's just soaring description of of love. This is, this is awesome. This is incredible. And I know I'm going to fail at it. Listen once again to what Paul writes. This is what these few verses of what we've been looking at over the last several weeks. I'm picking it up in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 4. 
Paul says this, he says, love is patient. It's kind. It does not envy, it, it doesn't boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And then he adds in verse 8, love never fails. Do you know how many descriptors of, of definers of love that Paul uses in verses 4 through 7? Have you counted those up? It's 16. 16 of them, ways that he says this is what love is and this is what it isn't. And then on top of that, at the very beginning of verse 8, he adds this, this qualifier that seems to pertain to all of them. Love never fails. Or to use the language of the Steve Alford All-American Workout, love never misses a shot. Love is all these things, all of the time. And, and I'm not. And in fact, it's not even close. But I, I don't think Paul's objective here, his desire to the church isn't to leave us feeling discouraged. It, it isn't to overwhelm us. And so I want us to take some time today to continue to process Paul's message to the church of Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus, when he taught us, he said, if you take the whole law and the prophets, it boils down to love God and, and love others. And so he, this is, if we are followers of Jesus, this is something that's at the core of, of who we are. So Paul continues, verse eight, he says, love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. At the very outset of, of these verses, what jumps out to me is that, that Paul is making the case that love is superior. Love is superior. One of the things that, that I've become pretty prolific at over these last few months is online shopping. Um, I was pretty good at it beforehand, but now it's about all you do. And one of the things I've, I've learned and kind of appreciate about it is that oftentimes if I go on Amazon or some other website and I'm looking at a product that I'm, I want to buy, you'll find at the bottom of the page a chart that, that compares this product to some similar products. And it will show you what this offers versus what the other products offers. And it helps you make a decision. It, it puts two things up against each other and shows you which one is better. And Paul here is, is, is making a very comparison between the value and the impact of love and the role of spiritual gifts in the church. And just, again, to remind ourselves a little bit of the background that, that Paul's writing into here. Because in verses 8 through 10, he's really returning to a theme that he addressed early on in, in this chapter. This issue of, of the priority of spiritual gifts and the way they're being exercised and implemented in, in the context of the church. And essentially, Paul's point is that you could be the most gifted person in the world. You, you could excel at these things, and yet if you're not acting out of love, if love isn't motivating this, then to use Paul word, Paul's word, you're a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Right? Paul's not, he's not dismissing the value of gifts. In fact, he's already talked about in, in chapter 12 the importance of them. They're absolutely vital in the life of the church. But if they're not, if they're not used, if, if, if they're not operated out of love, then Paul says they're, they're useless, right? They're, they're, they're the most annoying noise in the world. And Paul is, is doubling down on this. He says, where there's prophecies, they're, they're going to cease. Where there are tongues, they're going to be stilled. Where there's knowledge, that will pass away. But this isn't the case with love. Love is superior. Love never fails. 
The ESV translates it, love never ends. I like, I like the way the translators in the New Living Translation wrote verse eight. This is what they said. They said, prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love never will. Love lasts forever. See, Paul's, Paul's point here is simple and straightforward. When, when you stack up all of these spiritual gifts that so many in the church in Corinth seem to be clamoring for and desiring and even, even in conflict over, when you stack it all up and you compare it to the value and the impact of love, to Paul, the decision is, is clear. Love is superior. It's, it's greater. In fact, as we'll see in a couple of weeks, it is the greatest. So the question that I, I find myself asking as I, as I think through Paul's letter to, to the followers of Jesus living in Corinth is, is where, where does love fall in the list of qualities that, that God is developing in me right now? In fact, I... I want to grow in my gifts. I want, to, I, want to, I want to be a better leader. I want to be a better preacher of, of God's word. I, I, I want those things to continue to grow in my life. I want to be a better pastor. And I want to use those as a, as a father and a husband and a neighbor in all of these ways. But, I th- but what I'm realizing here is that, that I'm not partnering with the work of the Holy Spirit in my life to become more loving. If if becoming more loving isn't at the top of of the list of priorities in my life, if God isn't producing that in me, then according to Paul, my my priorities, my desires are misplaced, right? They're, They're in the wrong order because love is of highest value. Like you and I, we, we can become a lot of things in our life. But if, if we aren't growing in our capacity to love, then we missed out on what is of first importance. And then, and then Paul explains why, why it's superior, why it's of greater value, because he says, love lasts forever. Love lasts forever. When I was, uh, just starting at Chapel Street Church all the way back in, in 2007, I had my very first opportunity to lead one of our team of, of high school students down to Ecuador. And one of the things that I discovered in Ecuador is that one of their major exports is roses. Um, in fact, when you drive up and down the countryside in Ecuador, you'll see these gigantic greenhouses just filled with, with roses. And and so you can buy them there and actually bring them back and they're incredibly affordable. And so in this, this year, the, this first year I was on this team, it happened that I was returning from Ecuador on my wife and I's anniversary. And so I thought in this grand romantic gesture, I would bring home roses. And so I bought a, a, a box of these beautiful long stem roses. In fact, in a box, there was 24 dozen roses, like 288 roses, if I did my math right. And, and in my mind, I thought this is going to be beautiful. It really kind of turned out to be a little bit creepy. Like I, I, we looked a little bit like uh, President Snow in the Hunger Games. There was like roses everywhere. And... And one of the things that I didn't anticipate about this grand romantic gesture is that over the next few weeks, we constantly have to go around the house and select out all the roses that were dying to to throw them away because they don't last, because they're because they're cut, they're cut off from its source. The longevity of them isn't there. And it, it honestly became somewhat depressing in it um, because you recognized how temporary they were. Look again at, at these verses that Paul writes here, verses 8 through 10. He says, love never fails, it never ends, but where there are prophecies, they will cease, and where there are tongues, they will be stilled, and where there's knowledge, it will pass away. 
For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. So there's a bit of, of a debate around these verses regarding the role of gifts in the life of the church. And if some of these gifts were intended to be temporary as the church was launching in the first century, or if they continue on in, in the experience in the life of the church to this day. But no matter where you sort of view this understanding, your own personal opinion on that matter, what is, what is clear, what Paul seems to say without a doubt, is that when completeness or perfection comes, these gifts, they're, they're no longer necessary. So, so in my view of the text, at the point in time when, when Jesus returns, when, we, when he is here setting up a new heaven and a new earth, when we are present with him once again, we're, we're no longer going to need our spiritual gifts to help us get a a partial or a limited understanding of, of who Jesus is. Because we're going we're gonna to be with him. He's going to be in front of us. We're going to be seeing it and, and experiencing it firsthand. The, the need for our spiritual gifts will, will pass away. But to Paul, what remains, what continues, what lasts forever is love. As most of this week as I've been thinking about this passage and, and, and just mulling it over. The majority of my time I have, I've spent just on that phrase, love never fails or love never ends. Trying to understand what is it that Paul wants us to, to grasp about this. The Greek word literally means love never falls down. So I was wrestling with what is, what is Paul teaching the church? And perhaps this is been obvious to all of you, but it, it, it was this aspect of love, the, the eternal quality of it, the lasting aspect of, of love that I realized when, when Paul is describing love to us, when he gives us all these qualifiers, these depictions of it, love is, it, it, Paul's not only describing an action that he desires for the church to, to live out. He's describing a person. Love, love is eternal because God is eternal and because God is love. This is, this is exactly the point that the Apostle John makes in his letter to the early church. In fact, let's turn there. Flip over to, uh, to John chapter 4 if you have your Bibles with you today. This will be on your screens as well. But the Apostle John writes this. This is in, in 1 John chapter 4 verse 7. He says, dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. And this is how God showed his love among us. He, he sent his son, his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. That, that John's description of the nature of love and the source of love. Love, love is not just a, a quality that God demonstrates. Love, God is love, according to John. And again, there's two things that just sort of jump out to me as I think about what Paul's communicating to the church, as I think of what about John wrote here. The first, that, that God defines love because he is love. And by that I mean in order, in order for you and I to understand and to act in a way that is loving, it, it has to align with the character and the nature of God. So as I, as I think about what, how do I love my neighbor? How do I love my family? How do I love the world around me? 
How do we do that as, as a church? I, th I think what Paul is, what I'm getting is that in order for us to love everyone around us, I have to view them and respond to them in a way that reflects the character of God. Let me say that again. In order for you and I to, to love our neighbor, to love our family, to, to love the world around us, we have to view them and respond to them in a way that reflects the character of God. Which is, is the second thing that jumps out at me here because I think that we discover is that in every loving action, not, not the emotion, not the feeling, but in every loving action is a reflection of its source. Right? John writes, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. It's, it's that sample, right, of, of something greater, right? If you ever are planning an event and, or, or, or perhaps a wedding and you go to the caterer, and I know so many of you out there who have had weddings disrupted by this, and I, I know that's been hard, but in that moment when you're there and you're sampling some of what you want to serve your family and your friends, right? you're, you're tasting a, a sample of the source, right? You're tasting what the chef is capable of. You're getting a small bite of it. This, this is what Paul and John are depicting for the church. When we love each other, when we love the world around us, when we view them and, and respond to them, act in a way that aligns with the character of God, we're giving them this taste of, of who God is. And then this brings me to, to this third aspect of love that I just want to focus on for a minute here. And that is simply that love is for you before it's from you. Love is for you before it's from you. I said at the, the outset of the morning today that my first reaction to Paul's description of love in these verses was a lot like my, my reaction to my coach's summer workout plan. That, that it was inspiring, but but not possible. And, and as I was thinking about that, one of the questions that kept coming back to my mind was where, where did Paul get this definition of love? What, from, from where in his life or his experience is, is he getting this? And on the one hand, yes, as we already talked about, he's getting it from the character of, of God, but but Paul was committed to the Torah. He understood something about the character of God while he was hunting down Christians in, in, in the book of Acts. Like there were things that he, in fact, I would say that he felt like he was loving God in his actions to stomp out this, this heresy that he viewed. So what changed for him? Where did he experience it? And of course, it's, on a road to a, a, a town called Damascus. When he was going to pursue the very thing that he thought was a loving act, where Jesus meets him in that moment and, and he transforms him and he transforms him with the understanding of, of what the gospel is, what the gospel is about. And, and Paul gets for the very first time a, a, a understanding of what Jesus has accomplished, what the love of God has done for him. And he's transformed by it. It changes him. This, this for Paul isn't conceptual. It's not theoretical. It's, he experiences it. We can read about it in, in Acts chapter 9. See, what we have here is, is not merely Paul describing the way in which we ought to love each other. It is that, but it's not only that. Paul is also describing for us the way in which we have been loved. What, what empowers, what enables our ability to love in the way that we have been studying over these, these last four or five weeks together? Is it sheer determination? Is it just grit? Like we, we grit our teeth and we're going to make it happen? I think we all know that that only takes us so far. 
What, what empowers, what enables our capacity to love God in the, or to love others in the way that, that Paul is describing in 1 Corinthians 13 is an awareness and experience of how much God loves us. To living our life in the awareness of how much we have been loved so that we can love. In fact, if you look at one of Paul's other letters, this is in, in the book of Ephesians. Paul is praying for the church. Again, he's, he's talking to this, this group of men and women who are asking themselves, okay, what does it look like to live as a follower? What, is it, what does it mean to be an apprentice of Jesus? And this is his pastoral heart for the church here. This is what he writes. He says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's, the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. See, the only way, the only way that I know of to love people that looks, that looks anything remotely close to what Paul has been describing to us in 1 Corinthians 13, is to first understand and know the degree to which you are loved. To, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ for you. What he has done for you. See, know that, that love is for you before it is from you. When I was a kid, uh, I've mentioned this before, if you attend the Mill Creek campus, you've probably heard me talk about this, but I grew up outside of Dayton, Ohio. My dad was a aeronautical engineer. That was his degree in college, and so he, he always loved airplanes, and in Dayton is the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and the United States Air Force a museum. So we used to go there all the time. Uh, my dad loved it. There's seemingly millions of airplanes and there's plaques that tell all sorts of stories. And I, I actually appreciate it now much more as an adult than I did when, when I was a kid. But one of, the, one of the stories that my dad was always certain to kind of point out, there's a plaque in the United States Air Force Museum that, that tells a little bit of the story of a man named Jacob DeShazer. Um, Jacob DeShazer, I brought a picture of his B-25 uh, air uh, crew. And this was a group, Jacob DeShazer is kind of the one hiding on the far left of the screen. And um, he was a bombardier on his B-25 and his crew was a part of the Doolittle Raid. So if you don't know what the Doolittle Raid is, it was this response to Pearl Harbor. The United States wanted to respond to the attack, and so they came up with a way to, to actually um, bomb parts of Japan. And, and the thing about this raid is that it was, it was very, very dangerous. Because in order to do that, these B-25s had to take off from an aircraft carrier, so they stripped them of everything but the bare bones, the basic essentials. And, and most of these airplanes, after um, uh, their mission, never made it back to, to um, safety. Most of them crashed in Japan, crash landed, or in occupied China. In fact, 15 of the 16 crews either died in the crash or were, were captured. Um, and that was the case for Jacob DeShazer. He was a POW in Japan for the next 40 months of, of his life. Um, but amazingly, somewhat ironically, in the midst of all of this, um, these POWs were given one Bible to share among them. And DeShazer talks about just out of boredom and, and desperation, picking up this Bible and, and really discovering for the very first time the story of Jesus. Becoming aware for the very first time exactly how much 
God loved him. And this is what DeShazer wrote. He said, God gave me grace to confess my sins to him. And he forgave me of all my sins and, and he saved me for Jesus' sake. And he says, suddenly I discovered that God had given me uh, new spiritual eyes. That when I looked at the enemy officers and the guards who had starved and beaten my companions and me so cruelly, I found that my bitter hatred for them changed to loving pity. The Shazer actually um, returned from the war and went to a Bible college up in, in Seattle where he was trained in theology. He returned to Japan shortly thereafter um, to serve as a missionary for most of his, his life. Actually, in the very town that his, his bombardier had been sent to, to attack, he returned as a missionary in order to share the truth of who Jesus is and how much he loved him because he became aware of how much God had loved him. He experienced it for himself and he wanted these people to know so desperately the same love. See, this week, as, as you think about how we process this passage in the text, I want to encourage you to, to spend some time reflecting on these verses in 1 Corinthians 13, not only as a call to the way that we are to love our neighbors and our family and the world around us, I want you to read this as an expression of God's love for you. I, I want you to take in and to understand the degree to which you are loved. And then begin to notice, as your awareness of that grows, how does that impact your capacity to love others? And so as the worship team returns, I want to close us in prayer, and I want to do so by reading those same words that we just read from from the book of Ephesians. Paul's prayer for the church there, I wanna pray this over us as Chapel Street Church, that we will know the love of Christ and in knowing that love, we will love others. Would you pray with me? For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth derives its name, and I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, Chapel Street Church, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to in him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>